Joining us now in studio, Sean Patrick Stencil, nuclear campaigner from the environmental group Greenpeace. Nice to have you in the studio, Sean Patrick. Thanks for having me. Well, we just talked about Chernobyl, and uh, you were just there, right, three weeks ago. Yep. Why'd you go? I wanted to see with my own eyes uh, the devastation of Chernobyl. You know, in North America, it's often pundits talk about nuclear accidents in Chernobyl via st statistics. Uh, it's very inhuman. And I think seeing the accident, for me, brings home a lot of uh, why Greenpeace opposes nuclear power and why I, I'm dedicated to uh, stopping nuclear power. What stays with you that you saw? One, when you have a nuclear accident, unlike other energy technologies, there's a chance that you may never go home. Uh, the village of Chernobyl was founded in 900 AD. Uh, it's now a ghost town. And uh, so not only was there a huge environmental impact, there's a huge cultural impact. Uh, you now have a zone 30 kilometers that's patrolled by the military where people can't live. And I think that's a different line in terms of our energy choices on the possible impact that we could have. Um, the other thing that really stuck with me is that it brought forward the issue of radioactive waste. Uh, in Canada, we talk about it as a far off problem. The Nuclear Waste Management Organization will deal with it. Well, the Chernobyl reactor is basically radioactive waste now. And they're struggling with how do we isolate these radiotoxins from the environment for up to a million years. Did you really get to the plant? Uh, I stood in front of the sarcophagus. There's one side that they let you um, stand on. Uh, the radiation levels are about 100 times higher than background there. Um, the sarcophagus, they built in a real rush uh, in under horrible conditions. They now need to rebuild it. They're actually worried the wind may blow it down. Hmm. And the Ukraine asked Canada just last week for hundreds of millions of dollars to help uh, contain it because if there is another accident there, it will again affect most of Europe. If radiation levels are high, why do you know? You really want to get that close to it? You can. St I wouldn't stay there or raise my family there, put it that way. But you can uh, drop in. You can drop in. Every exposure to radiation increases your risk of cancer. Um, I got my dose. Uh, but they've, they've tried, the people that give you tours of the Chernobyl area know the hot spots. And um, they've done a lot to clean up certain areas that people visit, such as Pripyat, the town. They've removed most of the soil. Mm -hmm. So the radiation levels are a lot lower. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one of the things that is the quiet that when you walk through the Soviet town, it's still a, a tomb to the Soviet era. Mm -hmm. The hammer and sickle are still there. Yeah. It is, uh, reminds me of my childhood in a lot of ways. It hasn't changed whatsoever. Let me bring you back over on this side of the pond. Um, I've been covering Greenpeace's activities for almost 30 years, and uh, you guys are <clears throat> you're very good about getting publicity for what you do. I can remember, I guess, uh, maybe 25 years ago, somebody delivered a dead fish to the chairman of INCO <laughs> at an annual general meeting to make your case for why they were putting too many pollutants in their, in their stack up in Sudbury. Anyway, the latest is, uh, you guys, um, well, you handcuffed yourself to Ontario Energy Minister Brad Duguid's office and had a sit-in. What was that all about? Well, Greenpeace has a history of using civil disobedience to make a point on confronting decision makers. And we do civil disobedience, but another thing that we also do is we participate in, participate in processes. And in Ontario, we participate in the Ontario Energy Board, we participate with the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, and recently we've been participating in the environmental assessment hearings on Darlington. And one of the most disconcerting issues is often the issues of the most uh, environmental concern and public concern are off the table with nuclear energy. So in the case of building new reactors in Ontario, uh, we have never looked at and had transparent review of cost-effective options and safer options to building new reactors at Darlington. Well, even before you go there, I mean, you try to get some information about, you know, what, what if the worst case scenario happens? What are the health ramifications? Uh, when you tried to get that information from Ontario Power Generation, what did you run into? Uh, for the past three years, I've been trying to get information through Freedom of Information from Ontario Power Generation on the radionuclides. It's called source term. So in the event of an accident, what radionuclides would be released? Based on that, you can calculate uh, health consequences and financial consequences of an accident. So what'd they tell you? No over and over again. They've basically been hiding behind the September 11th shield, which is this information is too dangerous to release because it could allow terrorists to attack the station. And even with a Freedom of Information request, you got documents back saying? Uh, no. Basically, everything was censored. Can't help you. Yeah, we're now, uh, we're now at the adjudication stage. In March, in light of Fukushima, an adjudicator at the Information Commissioner's office asked OPG to rethink uh, its decision to withhold the information. And so has it? It said no last week. Hmm. Unfortunately. What would be the value in having that information? Well, Canadians assume the risk of nuclear accidents. Uh, Ontario Power Generation 
says everything's fine, their reactors are safe, so does Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, and so do all the suppliers. But what Canadians should understand is those people saying that are not actually liable for their actions. So if I hurt you, typically you can sue me for damages, but when it comes to the nuclear industry, you're not allowed to do that for full compensation. Oh, they've got an out. Yeah, there's something called the Nuclear Liability Act, <laughs> and it caps a liability at $75 million. And trust me, it costs them $75 million to move a radioactive waste barrel around in Canada. So in the event of an accident, it's not OPG that will actually assume the consequences. It's Canadian society. So we should have a right to actually understand the consequences of a Chernobyl-like or Fukushima-type accident. Okay, let me ask you about other consequences. And that is, we know that Ontario is dependent on its energy mix, about 50% for nuclear, right? And obviously you guys don't like nuclear. We get that. So presumably we've got to get... If you don't want us to be nuclear, we've got to replace that 50% with something. What do you got in mind? Well, I think we should take a stepwise process. And what does that mean? Well, in Canada, our reactors, uh, unlike American reactors, need massive repairs at midlife. It's called refurbishment. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's come to be known, little by little over the past decade, that refurbishment may not be cost effective. So last year, the OPG and the Ontario government said, we're closing the Pickering station. It is not worth the money to repair it. Uh, that means we're closing down one of our stations. We have the opportunity to decide, do we replace this with new reactors, which is the government's policy, or do we st start to reduce our reliance on nuclear power, just as we did with coal, by developing and ramping up other options. Ramping up? Ramping up. How long would that take? Pickering shuts down in 2020. It's the smallest nuclear station in Canada, so that would mean lowering our dependence from 50 to about 35%. That's doable within a decade. But unfortunately, we've had only directives from the government. There has been no review at the Ontario Energy Board of the cost of building new reactors, which we know the prices keep going up, versus green energy options, where the prices are going down. Well, basically, you want us to go from 50% reliant on nuclear to 35% in the next decade or so? That's the, the, the choice in front of us right now, is the Pickering Nuclear Station. After that, we need to have a discussion about the Darlington Nuclear Station, its refurbishment, and the Bruce Nuclear Station. And we can ramp up our renewables to bridge that 15% gap, in your view? Yes, yes we can. Uh, look what we've done with coal. Um, you know, in 2003, the Liberal government was elected with a promise to phase out coal. It took a little time. All the coal plants will be shut down in 2014. Our next opportunity to modernize our electricity grid is by replacing the nuclear stations. Remember, electricity demand is not going up. So it's about displacing current supply. Well, it's not going up now because we've, you know, just been through some terrible economic times. But if times get better, presumably demand's going to get higher as well, right? Well, and building a nu nuclear plant is not necessarily the best way to deal with um, increasing demand. It's, they're really large plants. Demand increases uh, incrementally. And a nuclear station, it's up really quickly. Uh, we know demand is going down right now to 2020. So let's take that opportunity to display some of our nuclear capacity and see how other energy technologies continue to evolve. We're going to do an interview with somebody after you who says that uh, natural gas is a pretty good bridge uh, fuel to get us from dirty stuff like coal to the renewables of the future. Do you agree with that? Well, one of the things Ontario should be doing a lot more of is developing combined heat and power plants. So these are, instead of building really large gas plants that we're building right now, uh, we should do what they do in Europe. You build smaller plants, it produces heat for a building or a neighborhood and electricity. This is off-the-shelf technology. It's cost-effective. But right now, there's actually a cap on the expansion because they need to keep the place on the grid for maintaining nuclear at 50%. So we need to have that discussion on those energy choices. Are we not having that discussion? No. Basically, the energy plan that we have today is more or less the same energy plan that we had in 2007. Uh, the government made a number of decisions in 2005 based on low-balled uh, nuclear costs and assumptions that we wouldn't have the potential for green energy. Well, we're seeing green energy take off. They've surpassed all their expectations. There's some rough roads there ahead. Um, but nuclear costs have increased, and we haven't reassessed uh, the cost effectiveness of doing that versus the other. Okay, here's where I say, yes, but. You say, I mean, you kind of sloughed it off by saying there are some rough roads ahead. This government, in its wisdom, made a decision to be the greenest jurisdiction in North America. They passed the Green Energy Act. They have gone whole hog into green energy. And what have they got for all of their efforts? They've got people coming down their necks saying, you guys are, you, you know, solar is too expensive, wind is too expensive, I don't want those windmills in my backyard, yada, 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 it never ends. So you say it's easy to go green, but the evidence is otherwise, is it not? Well, I think one thing is with green energy, it doesn't take long to build. So you face political consequences as soon as they go up. And one of the benefits we have with green energy, you get what you pay for. We actually know what green energy costs are. On the nuclear side, 
it takes 10 years to build a plant. So the last plant ordered in Ontario was by Bill Davis in 1974. Went online in 1992. No one was accountable for the cost overruns, really. And we'll see the same thing with nuclear plants. Both uh, McGinty and Hudak say we want to build plants. They won't be around when they go online. So I think that, in terms of politics, if we want to, uh, the government deserves congratulations for its leadership on green energy. If it wants to keep the door open to green energy, let's actually have a discussion of what the relative costs and risks are of going down the nuclear road. And that means releasing some of the information on nuclear costs, which we have not had okay, yet. Okay, uh, fair enough. But, but um, you know, going down that nuclear road, they, they want to keep the nuclear mix up. But when they took tenders on building new facilities at Darlington, they basically sent everybody back to the drawing board saying, this is way too expensive. Yep. Is it possible that at the end of the day, we will not get more nuclear built in this province because there's just too much money? I hope so. And I hope that drives us towards building more affordable green energy options. I think that's exactly the debate that we should have. What I'm personally worried about, Steve, is that the government now has decided that they want to look at building the CANDU-6 reactor design. That's a reactor design that dates from the 1960s. And that wasn't in the original tender that they put out. The reason they want to do that, it's not a prototype, so there's less risk. And they built a number of them. And there's fewer safety systems, so that means less cost. And yeah, to no, me, no, but, but, but they, they, I mean, they, let's face it, they would love to get the new ACR 1000, right? The most up to date, but they're not satisfied that it's cost effective enough or that it'll even work. I, so maybe that's why they're looking at an older model. Well, definitely, but I think in light of Fukushima, we need to be asking some hard questions about why would you build a 1960s reactor design instead of something uh, more modern and safer? We're not having that debate. And I think even with the ACR, what's interesting is I think the nuclear industry is actually thrown in the towel, the Canadian nuclear industry. On building it. Well, hang on. Sean Patrick, when was the last time an Atomic Energy of Canada Limited reactor had a major problem? Uh, Point Le Pro. Major. A major problem. It's three years uh, behind schedule. It's costing the New Brunswick taxpayer a million dollars a day. Um, and what's notable about that project, it was the only refurbishment project to undergo an independent review by a board. And that board said, don't go ahead with this project. Is that a, is that, is that a, is that a behind schedule problem or is that a safety problem? I'm talking when was the last safety problem an ACL reactor had? Well, it's uh, 1981. There was a pipe burst at the Pickering Nuclear Station. Uh, the modeling that they used, they always said a pipe would leak before it burst. Well, the pipe burst. It scared them so much that they spent the next decade rebuilding the Pickering Nuclear Station. It had only been operating a couple years. Okay, but I think what you're telling me is it's been 30 years since anything bad happened. That's a pretty good track record. The blackout in 2003, we actually had a level two accident because the backup generators at the Pickering Nuclear Station didn't start up. Okay. But we didn't have a radiation release, but I think one of the, the issues I think that Fukushima and Chernobyl remind us of, these are low probability, high consequence events. You guys keep talking about, about Fukushima, but we're not going to have a 9.5 earthquake in Ontario, and we're not going to have a tsunami off Lake Ontario. So, you know, do you worry that you're using an example that has absolutely no relevance for the Ontario predicament? What I'm worried about is often when the industry talks about safety, they'll say all our reactors are safe. What they really mean is we believe accidents of a Chernobyl or Fukushima type level are of a low probability. Therefore, we don't have to look at them. What we look at history is they've gotten their probabilities wrong a number of times. Fukushima is an example. So is Chernobyl. What could happen here? Well, this is called an unforeseen event. One of the things that struck me when I visited Chernobyl is I met the former operator of the Chernobyl nuclear station. And he said, Chernobyl and Fukushima tell us this. You take a complex technology like reactors, you add it with humans, and you add it with an unforeseen event, you end up in a situation where you can't cope. Okay, but I can see this Ontario government saying, look at you guys come, you barricade yourselves in my office, you handcuff yourself to my door. We've done the Green Energy Act. We've brought, we've brought more renewables on stream than any government in Ontario history. We have done the Samsung deal, which is going to put windmills up all over the place and, and create them here as well. And you guys are still on our case. What do you want from us? Well, we want them to continue their leadership. And the only way you can justify building new reactors in Ontario is by stopping the development of green energy, which this government has led. I don't think that's a legacy they'd want. Green energy right now is capped in 2018 because that's when they want new reactors to come online. And I think that's where we should, the government should continue to follow that path. I think, frankly, Steve, the government's been surprised by, uh, when I met with Dwight Duncan a few years ago, he said, you guys are right. Uh, people are coming to us left, right, and center saying they want to develop green energy. I don't think that's what their advisors told us when they came into office. So I think there's a learning curve going on, and we shouldn't foreclose mm -hmm. on building on the gains we've made so far. No, I hear you, but it, you know, it's always dangerous. You're trying to be constructively critical, I guess. But uh, you know, a lot of people get constructively critical, and then <clears throat> the public just sees the critical part, not the constructive part, and you've, suddenly you've defeated a government, and you've got something maybe that will be 
uh, less advantageous to your views. You think t uh, Tim Hudak and the Conservatives will be more uh, on side with what your plans are? Well, I think Tim Hudak should be challenged about his claims on nuclear power as well. The McGuinty government could be doing that. He says it's a low-cost option. That's not based on any fact that's out there. He says he's going to take the politics out of energy. Well, will he allow the Ontario Energy Board to do cost-effectiveness tests on refurbishment and new-build projects? Have you asked him this? Uh, yeah, a couple of times. And? Through Twitter. No response. You know, we get the response of, oh, Greenpeace will always oppose nuclear power. And I think... Well, they're not wrong about that. They're correct about that. Yeah. And I think for good reason. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the McGuinty government can help its own green leadership by opening up a discussion on new reactor costs. And I think, you know, Tim Hudak, who's portrayed himself as a defender of the ratepayer, should be asked some really hard questions about his nuclear plan. He just says, we're going to build more faster. Well, is that really good for the ratepayer? I think he can say that because he won't be accountable for the consequences. In our last 30 seconds here, the, the Liberal government uh, has gotten a lot of negative feedback over its green energy plans. How would you advise them on how to respond to that? I think start. Uh, we have to admit electricity prices are going up. That's a difficult political issue. And I think we should start by actually having a discussion of the relative costs of green energy. One of the benefits and the hard things to take politically is we have transparency on green energy costs. We don't have them on nuclear costs. And I think if the public could understand green energy costs in the context of the other option, we'll be having a different political debate. And we haven't had the release of those numbers yet. Gotcha. Sean Patrick Stencil from Greenpeace, good of you to come into our studio today and talk to us about your views. Thanks. Thanks for having me.